What's happening, my fellow true believers? James Hancock here. I just got out of seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp, a movie where some of the reviews I'd listened to had filled me with a little bit of anxiety, much like I felt the first time around with the previous Ant-Man movie. But sure enough, much like the first Ant-Man movie, this movie actually surpassed my expectations. Now, I'm not going to tell you that this is a home-run Marvel movie, because it's not. If you want a home-run Marvel movie, you can probably still catch it in the theater. It's called Avengers Infinity War, a movie that I absolutely loved. I've seen it three times in the theater so far, and I feel like if you want epic cosmic grandeur, that's what you go to. But if I'm going to continue this baseball analogy, if Infinity War is a home run, Ant-Man and the Wasp is at a bare minimum, a very solid single, perhaps even a double. And I guess it depends upon to what degree you have an appetite for family-friendly comedy sprinkled with a little bit of superhero action. And don't worry, I'm not going to give away any spoilers until I give fair warning. But as I was watching this, what it reminded me of was being 10 years old way back when, while I was at camp, they allowed us on one afternoon to go to the movies and I saw Inner Space from director Joe Dante. And much like the Ant-Man movies, that is a very fun, family-friendly comedy about mad scientists and changing size, etc. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Although it's probably safe to say I prefer Joe Dante's earlier film, Gremlins. Nonetheless, Inner Space is without a doubt one of his best movies, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to hear that if Peyton Reed, a director who I think is like in his late 40s, I think, if he saw that movie a lot growing up. Because like Inner Space, Ant-Man and the Wasp has a giant cast of very likable characters. Even the villains are pretty likable to a degree. The villains are almost non-threatening in a lot of ways. I guess the best way to describe this is that it's a low-stakes Marvel movie. The entire universe is not on the line. The world is not on the line. This is a movie about trying to rescue one of my favorite characters from my childhood, the Wasp from the quantum realm. And I'm not talking about the Evangeline Lilly wasp, I'm talking about the Michelle Pfeiffer wasp. As a kid in the 80s, I had the good fortune of being exposed to this incredible air on the Avengers, written by Roger Stern, and more often than not drawn by the great John Buscema. And like most eras of the Avengers, there was a revolving door of different characters who were officially part of the team. But during this era, more often than not, the Wasp was actually the leader of the team. It seems like for comic book readers in the 60s and comic book readers in the 80s, the Wasp was always a major character. Obviously, she was one of the founding members of the Avengers in the comics in Avengers number one. And I was absolutely delighted when I heard that they cast Michelle Pfeiffer in this role because Michelle Pfeiffer was also a huge part of my childhood. I loved her as Catwoman. I loved her in a lot of movies. But she's just one of many actors in this movie who are incredibly charming, very enjoyable to watch on the screen. Like last time, Michael Pena kind of runs away with the show in terms of the comedy, but his lovable group of rogues is incredible as well. The big surprise was Randall Park as an FBI agent named Jimmy Woo. He was funny as hell, and he has this incredible chemistry with Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd continues to look like he's 18 years old in spite of the fact that I think he's like 45, 46 at this point, but he absolutely has discovered the fountain of youth. But if you liked him in Civil War and Ant-Man, you get more of the Paul Rudd signature brand of humor. And as much as I've been a fan of Lawrence Fishburne and Michael Douglas for many, many years, I mean, those guys have been watching those guys for decades, I have to say the person who truly steals the show in this movie is Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp. I thought she was fantastic the first time around, but there's something about the way they choreographed her action scenes in this. She just looks so damn cool in that costume, and the combination of the blasters and the wings, it lends itself to this really beautiful slow motion choreography that you just can't really do with other characters, even with other flying characters in other movies. You don't have the same thing because her wings, the way they flap and curl around her as she's spinning, I mean, if you've watched the trailer, you've seen a taste of it, but she's an absolute joy to watch in action. And I'd be happy to watch Ant-Man and the Wasp team up for many adventures to come. But what's fun about these Ant-Man movies is that it's very successfully carved out its own little corner of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think that's part of the brilliance of Kevin Feige's overall master plan for the MCU is that he has all these little corners of the Marvel Universe that all have their own tone, their own feel, their own style. And then on occasion, you get these great movies like Infinity War, which stirs them all together in this, into this incredible jambalaya. And those movies really feel like an event, a special occasion. But I love the fact that Black Panther's got his own corner of the universe, and Ant-Man's got his own corner of the universe. Thor absolutely has his own corner of the universe. And I feel like these are opportunities for different directors, and, and in this case, Peyton Reed, to really experiment with their own style, their own approach, where the stakes are a little lower, where the studio's not entirely on the line. And I think after the colossal experience of Infinity War, especially given how Infinity War ended, and spoiler alert, at the end of Infinity War, like half the universe just turns into ash. After a movie is grim and intense as that, it was actually a very nice palate cleanser just to have this small, almost trivial, comedic adventure movie before we have to brace ourselves for the next big colossal Avengers experience. And maybe it's because I had very low expectations going into this, but it actually was one of the more fun movies that I've seen all summer. 
So that's about all I can say without going into some spoilers. So I'll just say this. If you're a Marvel fan, obviously you don't need a review to tell you to go. I'll just say this. This is second tier Marvel. I feel like in the first tier you have your great movies like Civil War or Guardians of the Galaxy or Infinity War, movies like that. And in the bottom tier you've got movies like Thor The Dark World, movies that no one really even cares to remember or think about or talk about all that much. And then you got your middle of the pack movies, and I guess Marvel's made, what, 18, 19, 20 movies at this point, which means that somewhere in that, that middle tier, that middle third of like six or seven movies, I think Ant-Man and the Wasp belongs firmly in the middle. So if you enjoy all things Marvel, and I pretty much do enjoy all things Marvel, at least when it comes to the cinematic universe, I think you're going to have an absolute blast, as long as you're not expecting some sort of life-altering experience. But with the broad generalizations out of the way, let's talk about some specifics. So let's talk a little bit about the plot of Ant-Man and the Wasp. Basically, the gist of the overall movie is find Janet Van Dyne in the quantum realm and get her out. But along the way, there are a whole host of complications. You've got the villain Ghost. As a result of an accident with the quantum realm when she was a little girl, her body's basically drifting in and out of various states of being, allowing her to phase through things, which made her the ideal assassin for S.H.I.E.L.D. for a while. But with only a few weeks left to live, she needs to get her hands on some of the technology that belongs to Henry Pym and his daughter Hope in order to try to extract a cure from Janet Van Dyne's mind inside the quantum realm. You've got Dr. Bill Foster in there, who is a former partner of Henry Pym. They had a very mean-spirited parting of the ways a long time ago. I absolutely love and adore Bill Foster. I remember him vividly from my time as a little kid when I first started getting into comics as Goliath, a.k.a. Black Goliath, where he basically had the same powers as Henry Pym, but he just did it with this cool-ass like white and blue outfit and a giant afro. But he's torn between trying to help Ghost while at the same time being very wary of some of the ethical boundaries that she's willing to cross. But in a lot of ways, he looks at her as a surrogate daughter. And that's one of the big main themes of this movie. You basically have three major father-daughter relationships unfolding simultaneously. Obviously, you've got Henry Pym and Hope. And they're very healthy, thriving, kind of mad scientist duo that, is work that are working together for a common goal. You've got Bill Foster, a.k.a. Goliath and Ghost. And then, of course, you also have Ant-Man and his little girl. And they're absolutely adorable together. And as someone with a lot of nieces and nephews between ages two and five, I feel like this would probably be like the ideal first Marvel movie to show to really little kids if you're worried about if you're worried about them like freaking out about something that might scare them. But I thought that was one of the more clever aspects of the screenplay, watching those three father-daughter relationships unfold simultaneously in different ways. Another complication in the story is Walton Goggins as the Southern gentleman, Sonny Birch, who's also an illegal arms dealer who wants to get a hold of some of Henry Pym's technology. He's a pretty non-threatening villain, and actually he's pretty funny throughout most of the movie. But periodically his goons show up, cause a lot of chaos. And lastly, of FBI agent Jimmy Woo, who I mentioned earlier, played by Randall Park, who basically is constantly checking up on Ant-Man, making sure that he's staying in his house because he's on a two-year house arrest due to the events of Civil War. He's not allowed to leave under any circumstances. If he does, he goes to jail for 20 years, which makes it very difficult to help Hope and Henry without getting in serious trouble and never getting to see his daughter again. So as a result of all these characters, the plot is pretty busy. At times, it almost feels a little chaotic, but I basically just sat back with my hands behind my head and just basically kind of smiled and giggled and enjoyed myself for the majority of the ride. Do all the jokes land with equal effectiveness? Absolutely not. Do all the action scenes of equal pop? Absolutely not. But on the whole, I was just having a fun watching all these characters kind of rub up against one another and bounce off each other. What I really like is how this movie has the potential to unlock yet another corner of the Marvel Universe. I feel like with movies like Doctor Strange, they unlock the mystic side and the kind of the supernatural side. And with Guardians of the Galaxy, they unlock the cosmic side. And with Thor, they unlock the mythological side. But now they have an opportunity to unlock the quantum side and when I was a really little kid there was this absolutely bananas comics called the Micronauts and I think there's some sort of weird rights issues which is why these days you almost never see the Micronauts mentioned in the halls of Marvel same thing happened with Rom the Space Knight but in the subatomic quantum realm in the comics it's basically this giant vast universe and some of them feel like medieval fantasy stories and some of them feel like something out of Star Wars actually my first issue where I ever got exposed to Scott Lang was in this subatomic realm where he and Thing teamed up and Thing was like in some sort of gladiatorial combat situation in any case at this point Henry Pym was no longer a superhero who's kind of taken a mandatory hiatus and Scott Lang was wearing the Ant-Man suit but that was my first exposure to that character but the quantum realm basically has limitless potential in terms of 
different environments to explore. And like this show in a little clip from the movie Animal House, where one of the students is sitting around smoking weed with one of his professors, and he's talking about how, how each atom could potentially contain its own universe. So as vast as the cosmic side of the Marvel Universe might be, the quantum realm is equally vast if Kevin Feige chooses to exploit it, which is why the first post-credit teaser has me so excited. And if you haven't seen the movie, bail out now because I'm going to do some heavy spoilers. But as we've seen the first post-credit teaser, Henry, Janet, Hope and Scott are all teaming up, trying to find a way to harness the energy of the quantum realm. They're all hanging around. They send him in. He captures some energy. And just as he's about to escape and come back to our reality, poof, Infinity War happens. Thanos has snapped his fingers. And all three characters that can bring him out of the quantum realm, they've all turned to ash. Which leads me to my big question. Will Scott Lang's story be resolved in the sequel to Infinity War next spring? Are they going to incorporate him into the story? Or are they going to wait until Ant-Man and the Wasp Part 2? Because the second post credit stinger definitely teases that that is coming, but with a little question mark, because obviously we don't know how the people who have turned to Ash are going to be reverted back to normal. I suspect the majority of the characters, if not all the characters who have been turned to Ash, will all be back. Whether or not people like Loki who got choked out in Infinity War will be back, that remains to be seen. But it would be interesting to see if Scott Lang somehow in the quantum realm would be able to have some sort of impact in one of the stones and Thanos' gauntlet and perhaps disrupt the harmony of it. My real theory on that front is that Gamora, who was killed in order to get the soul gem, somehow her soul is going to be tied to the soul gem, and through the soul gem, she's going to find a way to interfere with his control over the gauntlet. In any event, this was the perfect cliffhanger for the character, because as I just mentioned, I'm very excited about all the limitless possibilities of the quantum realm, so this gives them a couple years to figure out what they want to do with that. So I'm a little worried that I might be overselling a movie that, once again, I, I, like I said before, I don't believe is a complete home run for Marvel. So what would be my gripes? As I mentioned previously, it does feel feel a little trivial. This is one of those movies where whether you see it or don't see it, it doesn't really matter in terms of your overall understanding of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There are times where that signature brand of Marvel humor does spill over into the realm of kind of like broad, silly, low IQ humor, which maybe is not a bad thing because the audience on the whole was cracking up throughout most of the movie. Maybe one of the main flaws would be Ghost. Ghost is a little thin as a character. She looks insanely cool. She's absolutely stunningly beautiful. Her costume looks totally badass. And the actress Hannah John Kamen, I believe that's how you say her name, she definitely gives it her all. She just doesn't have a whole lot of material. However, she's not your typical Marvel villain where she's occupying a ton of screen time. She's just one of many pieces on a very big chessboard. But I think by far the greatest success of Infinity War was giving Marvel its first great multi-dimensional nuance classic villain in the form of Thanos. He's by far my favorite villain in the Marvel Universe. He also might just be plain and simple my favorite Marvel character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So on that front, Ghost is perhaps a little bit more of what we've seen in the past where you have these kind of thin one-dimensional Marvel villains. But who knows? Her relationship with Bill Foster might be nurtured and developed in movies to come. And my final gripe might be that they overdo it a little bit with all the giant ants in the movie. Some of the giant ants are doing things that are very clearly designed to make three-year-olds giggle and laugh. I mean, a shot of a giant ant playing an electronic drum set. Not exactly the most profound storytelling, but if you're a toddler, you're going to think it's absolutely amazing. And I should acknowledge that a lot of my love of this movie stems from a lot of nostalgia for not only Ant-Man and the Wasp, but characters from the comics, but also just from Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer. I remember going to see Romancing the Stone as a kid and being absolutely blown away. Michael Douglas was such a stud back in the 80s. I was a huge fan of most of his movies. And Michelle Pfeiffer is just a living legend, starting with like Scarface onward. I've just been a fan for decades at this point. But if you want to sink your teeth into some old school Marvel, like early 60s Marvel, pre-Avengers Marvel, because as I said, Ant-Man and the Wasp, they were founding members of the Avengers, but they were well established beforehand. But you have to start with Tales to Astonish, number 27, which basically reads much more like a mad scientist kind of horror comic than a superhero comic, because Henry Pym is just, is just starting to figure out his formula at that point and doesn't even have a costume. By Tales to Astonish 35, he decided to suit up, and by Tales to Astonish 44, you finally do have that Ant-Man and Wasp classic duo. But my favorite memories of them are always going to be when they're teaming up with the Avengers. You can always start at the beginning with the great Stan Lee, Jack Kirby heyday of like the first 10, 11 issues or so. My favorite issue ever featuring Henry Pym has to come from the Kree Skrull War. In the earliest part of the Kree Skrull War where Vision shows up, he's having some health problems and he collapses and Henry Pym shows up as Ant-Man and goes inside the Vision's body to try and fix him. It's one of the coolest comics that's ever been written or drawn and it features some absolutely astonishing artwork by the great Neil Adams. But if Scott Lang, that 
that Outlaw Ant-Man is more your thing, I'd recommend reading FF. There's been a couple of iterations of the Fantastic Four as well as the comic FF, and there is a difference between the two, but there's this great arc drawn by Mike Allred, who's one of the all-time great comic book artists. So if you want to see Scott Lang in a leadership role, leading a really unconventional Fantastic Four lineup, definitely check that out. And that's about all I have to say. I'm actually in a really good mood because for once, I didn't have a lot of people talking or on their phones ruining the movie, which is a common complaint I have at movies here in New York. And I learned a new trick. I did this great thing. Right before the movie started, I turned to my neighbor beside me because we were the only two people in the front row. And I said, don't worry. Before the movie starts, I'm going to turn my phone off. Obviously, I was going to do that anyway. It was a nice bit of subterfuge on my part. And they said, oh, don't worry. I'll do the same. And they turned their phone off. So I'm going to have to try that trick more frequently in the future. In any case, I'm going to start wrapping this sucker up. I sincerely hope we're going to see some cool quantum realm stuff in the future. The fact that Michelle Pfeiffer is wearing kind of a weird cloak and sword costume when they find her in it makes me think that they're going to absolutely dig into that side of the quantum realm that I remember from my own childhood reading the comics. But only time will tell. But if you enjoyed this reaction and review, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you want to talk about anything related to Marvel, definitely help me down on Twitter at Corbrax or leave me a comment in the comments below. But thanks so much for the support from my channel. I really appreciate it. It, but more importantly, onwards and upwards.